you have to transition. So in the beginning, you're doing a lot more free stuff for athletes. And then you transition out. For, as far as pro level stuff and pro athletes that are coming in, my referrals aren't because I had some magic marketing thing on YouTube or Instagram. But what I have is a network of people that I've worked with over the past 20 years. But you'd be surprised once you're in and, and a lot of it's word of mouth, you know. I finished in the late 90s, 19, I uh, graduated 1996. Um, and in the early 2000s, late 90s, you know, if you wanted to do anything from a marketing standpoint, it's still, you know, it was all about branding, um, which is still obviously very important. Uh, so for the sports side, I had developed, once I developed the whole recovery concept, I was trying to focus on that. And I tried to, you know, I had branded the name Recovery Doc and I thought it was very clever and, you know, and I had a logo made up. But in the end, what I figured out was it was more about who, about me on a personal, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the athletes and that I probably, because then it's hard to brand your regular clinics. Like, how do you differentiate that? And if you have one clinic, it's not a big deal. But if you're really trying to do, reach out, you know, globally to athletes, let's say, and like be on a lecture circuit and write and you know you're better off branding your name so uh, that would be the one uh thing i'd recommend to young chiropractors that are trying to um, do this sort of thing you, you definitely want to brand your name um and also as chiropractors we love just we name all our clinics right you know but we're the only ones that do that for the most part you know a lot most of the mds they might, they're branding more now, but those are like these massive groups that are doing it. But when they're small, they're just practicing under their own name. Um, so I think it's important to do both. So um, that's why I'm taking down the recovery doc website and branding my name because then I can brand everything I do, not just the, my sports stuff, the clinics, the cream, whatever, um, business stuff that I might be doing that's related to healthcare. Um, now that it's expanded beyond that. So I think of, that's a, that's a super good tip. And if I, if I peel it back, even before you got there, you had to start somewhere. So how, how do you get it? How do you even get interested in, in sports care to, to begin with? And then I'd love to kind of go through the road of, of how you get, you know, how do you get your first well-known person kind of thing and all that? Yeah. How do you even get started with all of it? Okay, so I think it's important. Uh, so, so I started like a lot of the Kairos that are into sports. I was always into sports. I, I was a high school athlete. I probably could have ran Division three in high school, maybe, but there was no way I was going to suffer, you know, to just run. So that wasn't an option for me. So I was done after high school. Um, and I was always interested in like lots of different sports, not just the classic American sports, football, baseball, basketball, hockey. You know, I, I liked other sports stuff, Olympic style sports, because I came from track and field. Um, we're Italian Americans. So I also like Formula One and race car driving and all that kind of stuff too. So I'm just into all performance, you know, I've just always been interested in that. So in, in chiropractic school, we had the sports injury club, which then morphed into the sports performance club. And it was just back then in the nineties, it was just a bunch of different chiros. And we had like maybe one person in your class was an athletic trainer before they went to chiropractic school. Most everyone, all the other people were like biology majors or chemistry majors. It's very different now when I go back to NYCC and you have a lot of kids that are athletic trainers, exercise science majors, kinesiology majors, which is really cool. So, you know, I was always interested in it, but I was never the kind of guy that said, I'm going to build a sports injury practice. I think I was. I was um, realistic enough to know it's hard enough to start a practice and be successful than, than to start out saying you're going to be, you know, the sports injury guy. So, but I was always interested in it. Um, and I kept it there, you know, in the back of my mind on day very, very early. Um, so the way it all started for me was I had a boxer walk into the clinic and he had an injury. Just a local boxer, club level, no one, no one really that important. Um, and I took good care of him. Um, and he told his promoter about me, and there was no one really around. And then I met with the promoter, and I was really young, and they were 
you know, I started to treat like everyone under that local promoter's banner. And it was really exciting because, you know, I would go to the fights and stuff. And then they said, hey, can you be a cut man? So I'm like, well, I see these guys. I was like, it doesn't look that difficult. I'm pretty sure I could figure this out. Of course, there's nothing public, really published or articles. And it's just trying to get it out of the old guys that were doing the, the cut work was like next to impossible. <laughs> um, you know, they wouldn't give up their secrets. But once I figured out, I mean, it, it really, you're, you're legally only allowed to use certain things in each state to coagulate the blood and control swelling. I mean, it's not rocket science, you know, and you only have a little bit of time. So I started to do that for them, uh, for their fighters, and um, which was very exciting. So I was in the corner of a lot of these fights. And then you just meet a lot of people uh, when you're in the, in the loop. And, you know, I was always interested, obviously, in new techniques and just like everyone is. And I was adding them to my, my arsenal, my toolbox. Um, and I was always interested in martial arts as a kid. And so it was a natural thing. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of what gave me a foundation. And then, you know, eventually you get a world champion walks in your clinic. And, you know, that's just what happened. And then in the D.C. area you know, I got to be really well known as a chiropractor, then just as a, as the doctor. And then I would do a lot of free stuff, um, for, you know, a lot of the gym. So everyone knew if they had a boxer, look, this is not, <laughs> you know, they're professional boxers, but you know, most of these guys are not making any money. Right. You know, same thing with UFC fighters. You see guys in the UFC, you think they're making money. They're not making money. You know, not all of them. A lot of them are not making, you know, anything spectacular. Uh, some are making a lot of money, right. but, um, uh, boxing is even worse. The disparity where you have the world champions, the top tens making a lot more money. Uh, so seeing that I was like, look, come to the clinic. I'll do what I can. At least I'll point you in the right direction. And because of that, I would get everything. Like I was getting stuff that did not belong in my office all the time, you know, which was cool. Cause I could at least get to examine and get to experience it. Um, and orchestrate stuff and being a team doctor and boxing, which is what I essentially was, got me, you know, I very, at a really early age, I had to learn how to tell a doc, uh, you know, an athlete that you're, you're finished with your career. You know, um, I just thinking of one of the guys who had a brain malformation that the CSF, if he would have gotten swelling would have died. So I had, a, I was the one who had to order the MRI pre-fight, got it got that, talk to a radiologist, and then, you know, have to retire them. You know, a guy who, you know, his orbital bones were fractured into and it affected his vision. So you're collaborating with these other, you know, and you're trying to make deals for some of these, look, this guy's got no money. What can you do for me? You know, that kind of stuff. I was really involved, but that goes a long way in the community that you're serving. Um, and then, you know, uh, once you made it pro and you could afford me, then you're going to get charged, you know, and that, that's another piece that you have to learn as a young, you can only do so much free stuff, you know? How do you, and how do you, how do you balance that? I know I'm a boxing fanatic and I see sometimes even the fights like on Showtime, they'll do the published purses and somebody that's on Showtime as like an opening bout. Some of these guys sometimes are 10,000 bucks. And I know. That's six weeks at camp. That's 15% to a promoter that, you know, they're making, taking home 2000 bucks maybe. And they're right. like on Showtime, but how do you balance out the free versus the paid. How did you do? Were, were you like, let me do as much comp as possible because that's going to come back on the back end? Yeah. Did you monitor that? I know there's always those questions for the younger docs of how much of that should I do? What's been your experience? I think, you know, that is like the golden question, right? Uh, that really is. I mean, I, I probably get asked that the most. Um, and I would tell people that if there's no magic answer to that question, um, and you know, I, I early on because of the business growth had the liberty of spending more time and, and giving more free to, to, to the early athletes I was working on. Um, but you know, a lot of them had health insurance because a lot of these guys are working on top of it, you know, so Good they point. would at least you're covering them through the health insurance. The problem is the non chiropractic classic chiropractic stuff that I started to do early on, which is all the recovery stuff is time consuming, you know, you're monitoring your, you know, this stuff, you know, I was doing a lot of functional movement screening before that was a thing, you know, and I'm using video motion analysis, um, 
with it because I didn't understand how you can do a, you know, single leg, double leg squat. And, and I had an, you know, an instructor was going, look, see, it's moving medially. And I'm like, not, not really. I don't really see that. And I've been doing this for 15, you know, 10 years or whatever it was. So I also then um, trained on using dart fish, which is a biomechanical pro program. Back then you couldn't even get training. So I actually got certified to do bike fits um, at Serata Cycling Institute. So I can learn how to use the program and do bike fits because I was also, <laughs> that was the second piece that added on. Okay. Um, so back to the original question. So it's really tough. You know, you want to do some free um, and you got to kind of, it takes time to gauge that when, when they need to start being charged something yeah. and you need to charge something. I mean, I famously, you know, uh, like I would never work for a professional team ever for free. I mean, I, well, right now I would never work for a pro team period. I'm done with that. I would, wouldn't want to do that. It sounds great it's a lot more work and they don't like to give you a ton of money. Um, mm -hmm. and I know guys that are doing it for free. I'm like, you're insane. Like, what do you, and then they wonder why they're not really that, you know, engaged, you know, yep. um, they're just cracking backs and, you know, in and out. And, uh, there's a certain value that you have to have. So if they can, have, my thing is if you can afford it, you sh you're paying me. So pro athletes, I don't do that for free. Okay. Um, no, you know, and I never really did because I did have a problem with you making a million dollars, half a million dollars, ten million dollars a year, and you don't want to pay me. Like this isn't, especially now. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, magic spoon cereal. You know, right. I'm not just gonna. You can't just send me product and the. You know, I, I don't. I'm not in that space. I'm, I'm worth it. And if you if you want that expertise, you're gonna have to pay. You know, uh, and I, I think some people won't. Is and, and Criti critically important critical thing that you need to transition to that um now our, our balancing that out is um is difficult and you have to transition so in the beginning you're doing a lot more free stuff for athletes and then you transition out for, as far as pro level stuff and pro athletes that are coming in most of them aren't going to do you know most of them aren't coming into your clinic anyway you know on a global perspective um but you'd be surprised once you're in and, and a lot of it's word of mouth, you know, most of my, my referrals aren't cause I had some magic marketing thing on YouTube or Instagram or whatever. Um, cause there was nothing like that back then. And I don't really even have a good following. Um, but what I have is a network of people that I've worked with over the past, you know, 20 years that I did good work. I took care of the people around me. You know, that's another thing. You know, don't just worry about yourself. You got to take care of the everyone else on the team. You know, if there's other staff, other people. These are the people that have potential to refer you business. Take care of everyone. Um, and I did that. And, and I also, I think another thing is people love, and I still see this all the time. You know, you get a new technique or a new, you know, especially like with functional movement right now, everyone's got their own system and people just love like bashing everybody's system and, or their profession or, you know, so if you're part of a team in a group and you don't agree with it, you know, you don't necessarily have to hammer that in. Like people's got to stop trying to be right all the time about everything. It's not that, you know, it doesn't work like that. Trust me. When you're in a group setting, you got to work with who you're working with. And even if you think you're, they're fine with you, as soon as you leave, they're talking about you behind your back. And I'm talking about <laughs> athletic trainers, orthopedic surgeons, PTs, um, and medical doctors. You got to know your stuff, and you 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 know you can't be. You, you have to slide in gradually into what they're doing and appreciate what they're doing. You you know, and let them do their thing. You know, don't try to step on their toes because they will. They you know. They'll either bark at you or they'll never, you'll never get another referral. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great advice. And when you think about recovery, a place I'd love to go is what are some of your favorite, you mentioned uh, an assessment that, that you're super interested in, but what are some of your favorite recovery tools or strategies or products? What, what do you look for? What have you found to be like those can't, you know, I, I, I need this to be able to get in and do my, do my thing. Right. So if you look, at recovery from an injury standpoint, of course, I, I'm a chiro we were chiropractors. I think chiropractic is the best recovery tool um, and all the soft tissue types of strategies that we have. 
I think you got to be open minded. And if you're doing Graston or ConnectX, um, the NYCC tool, if you're doing that and it's not working, you know, there's there's a lot of strategies and techniques that you can learn from and try. And I think that's what I might do differently is I'm not, you know, in, I'm not just like all about one thing. I'm not all about, you know, whatever that name technique is. Um, so I'm trying not to get myself in trouble, but you know, <laughs> so I, I did all the taping classes and, you know, like rock tape had sponsored my classes early on before they, my, on my recovery. So, you know, I think I really don't have one thing that I, I can say with the exception of sleep. I think sleep monitoring has always been, uh, and, 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 and it's changing. Like what I used to do to monitor an athlete's sleep you know, even five years ago is totally different than what I'm doing now. And they're not perfect yet. You can trust me. Like a lot of these devices, whoop and biostrap, biostrap's my favorite whoop. I don't, I'm not, I'm just not down with paying a subscription every month for that type of service. And you're not getting what you think you're getting out of it yet. You know, maybe if there ever was, and I'm very, very interested in biometrics right now. It's like super interesting to me, but sleep is definitely, um, something that you can kind of help with your athlete and you don't necessarily have to do it to the level I am where I'm going over there, how they slept each night, how much time they spent deep sleep, you know, how much REM they had. And, you know, you're trying and you're basic, most of the devices now you're making a guess. There used to be a device that was around that they would wear as a headband and you were getting some actual brain wave, like more accurate activity levels. Yeah. But it went out of business, unfortunately. Um, but it gave me better data, but this is the, the newer devices are, you know, they're getting better. And uh, it's kind of where we're headed um, in biometrics. So if you had to ask me what the one thing, it's definitely sleep and then nutrition overall. Those are the two pieces. But again, my whole book is on the six pillars of recovery. So my, you know, my first instinct is there is no one thing. <laughs> you know, that's the fallacy. Like, you can't go to you, like, I think we talked a little bit about the cryo chambers and I'm sure you're going to get some hateful tech uh, messages below this video. Cause um, I don't really think it's a viable business model. I'm sure there are people making money using that particular device, but I just, it's just not going to, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, not for a sports injury recovery. Now, if you're doing that, um, because you're doing intermittent fasting and you're trying to do cold, you know, treatments to your body for autoimmune disorders and stuff like that. And it's part, part of your protocol. And that's different as your patients are coming in. But like, you know, the way I feel with ice, I mean, there's an entire book that written that says that we shouldn't be icing even acute injuries, you know, and he's backing it up with research and science, you know? Uh, so there's debate on this whole topic. and uh, I've flip-flopped and gone all around this because it's such a hot, debatable topic, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of give you my two kind of points of view on it. Yeah, please. I mean, so, so like, <clears throat> of course, we've learned it's an acute injury, right? So there's inflammation. We want to control inflammation, right? So you use ice to vasoconstrict the blood vessels, decrease the inflammatory uh, cascade and the response. But I would, all, the flip side to that is there's, um, there's also uh, physiological changes that occur when you train, right? And the whole point is the overload, that principle where you're overloading everything. And it's not just your fibers or your muscle tissue. You know, there's things happening in your mitochondria. There's things happening hormonally to you. And what happens when you chill the entire body? You're lowering the response, right? You're decreasing everything that's going on. Um, so who's to say that that partial inflammatory response is not a good thing and that it, it is creating adaptation you know maybe maybe you're uh, retarding your adaptation potential right so why would you then jump in and and as a pro protocol to just say okay everyone's got to ice now throw in the fact that they have to drive to your clinic this athlete after working at especially at the pro level i mean my guys I, I don't, cause you know, we're, we're doing two a days for hours and then they're going to get in a car, drive to the clinic, get it, get, get, you know, get ice, uh, get a uh, cryo chamber and then drive back home, you know, like, and, and if they're in LA, there, it takes them two hours. Like, <laughs> yeah. does that make any sense to you at all? No, you're not recovering. You're not resting. And then you got to train an hour. Like it makes no sense to me. 
And especially when you can take a cold shower and there's studies that are very, very similar, you know, and I'm sure they're going to bombard me with whatever research the companies give you that then turn out to have 15 subjects in it. Um, but uh, you can get a similar thing. So I'm not completely against cold. I'm not even against the chambers. I'm not saying any, you know, completely negative. I just, you have to look at what the athlete needs. What do they need? Can they get away? away with a cold shower uh at the end of a workout can they get away with a cold tub bath you know and that's cheap and easy you know where do you spend your dollars for this athlete that's a whole nother thing uh, is it nutrition is it food is it sleep is it because there's so many devices and so many you know the trainers are going to want to do what they're going to do um and there's sometimes money uh invested in that. But, you know, when we have like Amir Khan, who's making millions of dollars per fight, then it doesn't matter. I get, he's got to cook and I, you know, I don't, a chef is making his food for him. So for nutrition and any supplement I'm on, he's never going to walk out, you know, sleeping at altitude and having an oxygen chamber. You know, we could do anything with guys like that, but it's, it's the bread and butter people that you, or Olympians that you really got, what's the bang for the buck, you know? Um, I mean, it looks sexy on Instagram and you have Floyd Mayweather in there with his gloves and everybody, but trust me, they're not going back all the time. I mean, just, <laughs> they're not, you know, they're getting paid or they're just doing it. And then like, I don't feel like doing this anymore. You know, um, no shortage of widgets out there. That's for sure. No, there's no shortage. That's well said. No, no shortage of widgets. And, um, and what's the sport, you know, are we talking about boxing and MMA where you're in football where you're a lineman and you got to perform the next week? You know, do you need, uh, you know, do you need ice and ice baths and cryo? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that's an answer. There's so much acute inflammatory response. It's really, there's way more benefit to that than, than uh, but like an Olympic high jumper, does she need to jump in a, in a cryo chamber right after her workout? No, we're not doing that. So. I think I, there's there's so there's so much. I think we just skimmed the surface. So I'm definitely gonna I'm, a, I'm preemptively asking you to come back on because I think there's yeah. so much that we can dive into. But for anybody that's listening and watching that wants to learn more about you know where you are, what you're up to, where where can you point and direct them? I think for now the best spot is my Instagram page. You know, just at Dr. Rick Rosa and. Uh, if you message me, I, I'm famously always getting back to whoever, if you're a Cairo, you know, especially young Cairos, you know, I will help you out. I will get on the phone, uh, especially if you're an NYCC grad, but I'll, and, you know, because I'm <laughs> that college. The preferential, college you get in the primary inbox if you're an NYCC grad. General yeah, you, inbox get, you get the VIP <laughs> treatment, but no, I, I, I really do want to help um, our profession as much as I can. Uh, and I feel that I've been, I've everything I have in my life is from chiropractic and I'm really happy. And so I'm trying to do as much as I can for the generation that's with me and we're behind me. Um, and you know, just to try to make this whole thing grow because I think we have a huge value. And also I think we are a great niche for what the type of stuff I'm doing. Um, and I think it's really interesting. It's, it's cause you could just, you know, soft to, Issue and adjustments after a while can get a little bit, you know, for me, it got boring after a while, right? It's not, you know, that's why the athletes are so exciting because they have complicated issues. You know, there's nothing more exciting to me than someone, you know, like Amir Khan, I get a call at a, uh, from California saying no one's able to fix his hip problem. He's got a fight in five weeks and you're the, you know, I'm giving them your name and number and they, you know, they fly you out to talk about pressure, right? They fly you <laughs> out for a week and you got a week to friggin' solve this problem. And it's not like they care that he's had this since he was 17 in the Olympics. They want you to fix this. You know, there's a lot of money involved and, uh, and all the problems you have with that, you know, you show up at a gym, not invited by the trainer, the head trainer as a chiropractor. Uh, and he already had a chiropractor, uh, it, you know, it's like, what? Well, it's like, it's a very delicate dance you're trying to do, you know? Um, so I, I mean, I've kind of seen it all, I think. I can imagine. But I'm so. still learning. I'm still learning, man. I, I'm still trying to learn as much as I can. Constant, constant work in progress. So yes, uh, that's, that's me. <laughs> sweet. Well, Rick, I really appreciate having you on and uh, I would encourage docs. If you are interested in sports, chiropractic performance, recovery, 
uh, please click the link below. Hit up Rick. He, we, we're going to go into subsequent episodes. He has an entire uh, clinic enterprise. He is involved also on the product side with some really cool stuff that we'll dive into in future episodes. But Rick, I really appreciate you coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Cool. Take care of yourself. Hey, what's going on? If you loved that video, be sure to subscribe to this channel. The Evidence-Based Chiropractor puts out videos all the time at the intersection of marketing and research, showing you how to grow your practice while also growing your knowledge base. So if you liked it, be sure to comment down below or hit subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.